The following program is made possible in part by a generous grant from the Educational Foundation of America. City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Clerman Endowment. Presents Spotlight. Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest is the outstanding American actress, Jane Alexander. Jane, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with a production that was very important in your life, but was very important in the American theater, The Great White Hope. Mm. How, did you, how did you get involved in it? And uh, well, I was um, an actress at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., were you and part of a permanent company, the, oh, the year-long permanent company? Yes, yes. There was, I guess there were about a dozen of us in, in that time in the 60s. And um, there was uh, Ned Beatty, Robert Foxworth, Bob Prosky, Ronnie Cox. There was a whole bunch of us. And uh, The Great White Hope was one of the new plays that was being done in my third season there. And um, I was asked to play Eleanor Bachman in it. And they brought James Earl Jones in from New York to play Jack Jefferson, i.e. Jack Johnson. Right. Was he the only person uh, from the outside, outside the company who was brought in, or were some others brought in? Oh, I think we brought in some others of the older men, um, yes. But basically, it was the arena stage uh, company. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And did you, did all of you working on it, did you have any idea it was going to be the landmark production that it turned out to be? Well, <laughs> the first time Zelda Fitchhandler and Ed Sharon, who uh, Ed was the directing the play, and Eld, uh, Zelda was uh, running Arena Stage, and the founding person of Arena Stage, um, gave me the script. I read it one night, and I came back and I said, "My goodness, it's a wonderful play, but it sure ends peculiarly." And Ed said, "That's just the first act." <laughs> <laughs> when we did the first reading of it, it was seven and a half hours long. Oh, are you serious? Seven and a half. I mean, it was that thick. Um, so then Howard Sackler worked hard to... The author. The, yes, the playwright, uh, with Zelda and with Ed to cut it down. When we ran it in arena, at Arena, it was four and a half hours long the first time. Then it was whittled down to about, gosh, maybe four. When we did it on Broadway... It was about three hours and 15 minutes. When we did the movie, it was an hour and 20 minutes. It had really been, re in those increments, it was reduced. Yes. I think its best running time was the Broadway one. That was Three right. hours and yeah, 15 minutes. Because it minutes. was an epic. Yes, it was. Yeah. Well, it was a fascinating production from many standpoints. The part that you played, of course, it was a fictionalized version of Jack Johnson's life, the yes. great... Uh, black prize fighter and who was in Cuba and this you but you were as I recall your character was really an amalgam a combination of several women in his life isn't that correct? Correct yes Eleanor Bachman was her the character's name and she was um, based on three women two of which I believe uh, my memory doesn't serve me well right now Jack Johnson married and the third he had a long affair with uh, they were white women and one of them did kill herself as Eleanor does in the play. I think, I really think it was a very wise decision on Sackler's part to make it fictionalized to, to really reflect the truth but also to do this because it gave an opportunity for a character such as the one you played which uh, did involve all three of these people who were in, in, in real life but uh, mm. it gave us in the audience someone to be involved with and someone to identify with, and, the, and it gave you something as an actress, mm. <laughs> a part that you I got a Tony Award for, and then went on. It, it really was, it probably, did it, did it change your life? Totally changed it. I was very happy at Arena Stage. Um, I was doing what I wanted to do, which was the classics, or, and, and a lot of new plays as well. And uh, I loved being a company member. I loved living in Washington. I loved Arena Stage. Everything about it was perfect, and bringing up my child, and 
Um, in Washington was great. Well, when, when we came to New York, I had no idea it was going to be such a big hit. Had no idea really? at all. Well, because it was, it was, it was a very important play from, from just a, a pure, the reason that it was, I believe, almost the first play that came from regional theater to New York. That's correct. It was the first one to come from regional theater. It was also a play that was addressing um, the, the issues of the time, yes. which, which had to do with civil rights and uh, race, uh, relations. race and relations. It was the height of the black power movement. Yes. Uh, 1967, so it 68. It was yep. very topical. Yes, and uh, as well as a, and, as a powerful, as a powerful drama. And Muhammad Ali, who had been Cassius Clay before, and won the belt, and then had it taken away from him yes, that's because right. he refused to uh, he re refused to sign up and go to Vietnam. So it was a very topical play because they took the belt away from Jack Johnson in the play. And as a matter of fact, it was Muhammad Ali's favorite play. <laughs> well, <I've laughs> and he came did three he, times. Did he really? Yeah. That's fascinating. He said, this is my story except for that white chick. <laughs> <laughs> namely you. Yeah, namely me. <laughs> well now, had you, um, when did you, because Ed Sharon, who you mentioned, is, was the director of that play. Mm -hmm. It changed his life, I'm sure, too. And he's your husband. How now? Uh, now. He, he wasn't then. He wasn't he is then. Now. When did, well, when, when he since directed you in I think I read 15 or 16 productions. At least, at maybe. Least. He says 17. I've never counted, so. So you don't know how no. many. Well, how long after that then did the, the two of you actually, uh, did you get married after that? We didn't get married until 75. Oh, really? So it yes. was really seven or eight or nine years later. Yes. After yes. that. Yes. And then, well, I'm going to skip ahead because of mentioning uh, Ed as a director. Mm -hmm. Uh, to one of the things you've done most recently, which is the visit uh, mm -hmm. on Broadway, uh, because that's, of course, a totally different character, <laughs> uh, Clara Zakanasian, uh, who is the richest woman and also, in some ways, the most domineering woman in the world. Uh, tell me about preparing for that part, and uh, uh, it was it was it uh, that must have been a real challenge to play a, a, a part that was so, on the one hand, had been linked with. Uh, Lynn Fontan, who played it on Broadway 30 mm -hmm. years ago or so, but also it's such a, a, a strong character and a character with so many uh, facets to her. What, tell me about preparing for that part. Well, I don't think I've enjoyed playing anything as much as I've enjoyed playing Claire Zakanasian. Is that because as, she's so powerful and so mean? or? <laughs> you know, it has a lot to do with that. I'll tell you, there's, as, as, as a woman and then as an actress, uh, as a woman, we don't get to use power in the same way that men do because it still is a male society. Um, and uh, as an actress, the roles are just not there where the powerful figure in the play is the woman. There's Queen Elizabeth yes. in a couple of the plays about Elizabeth. And there is Claire Zakanasian. And that is about it. If you think, now there are some plays where... Maybe the little foxes, but... Uh, maybe the little foxes, yes, possibly. But not many. But not many plays. So to play the wealthiest woman in the world and a woman to whom everybody else in the, in the play kowtows, grovels, in fact, yeah. <laughs> is really fun. And, and, <laughs> and who also manipulates people in the most incredible way. Oh, yes. I mean, she, she's evil and she, she admits she's evil. But it's a lot of fun to play. I'll bet. Tell me about how you arrived at the makeup and the clothes, because everything's really quite exaggerated in yes. terms of the, the clothes you wear. And you have a wooden leg in it, which yeah. you sort of proudly display at one, one point. Well, um, I've been thinking about this play for uh, about four years. It's a play that I wanted to do. And coming out of the 80s of Reaganism and consumerism, I felt it was a very good play to do about that. Durenmatt was writing about Nazi Germany, but I think that this was also a play that's very applicable to a time in which anybody has a price. Well, greed doesn't go away. That's right. <laughs> greed is <laughs> always there. And it was very much with us in the, in the 80s. So, uh... And so I've been thinking about this a long time. I find that I work best if I'm given a lot of time just to, to kind of ponder things. And... Um, I knew that Ed regarded the play of Durenmatt as a parable. And therefore, I began to think of who, symbolically, Claire represented. 
And her name, in fact, is Akanasian, is an amalgam of, I know one of them is Onassis, and the other two were in the time of the 50s and 60s, also very powerful uh, capitalist figures in the world. So she represents capitalism at its worst. So I don't know how the whole idea of the makeup came to me, but it came to me so clearly that one day I just ran up into my bathroom and I just put it on in five minutes and I came down and Ed went, ah. <laughs> he so said, that's it. Well, you, when you got that reaction, you knew you had it. That's right. And uh, then I knew so that I... So it was I, really your idea yes, the way that this look that she has. Yes. And then I, Ed wanted a painterly production. So I knew the painters that he was calling on were painters from the 20s and 30s primarily. Um, I wanted her, because she's older, to have an earlier painterly reference. So I went back to Gustav Klimt at the turn of the century and um, Lo even Lautrec in the look of the hair, yes. uh, La Galou and all those kinds of things. So that's how her look came about. We should say that except for you, and the man playing opposite you, Harris Eulen, who was playing the, uh, the part opposite you, everyone else is wearing a half mask. Correct. Which carries through the painterly and the, the idea that this is a parable or morality play or exactly. whatever you want to call it. There's an abstract quality about it. Yes. And um, there's a reason, I think, that Dorenmott has, at one point, uh, talks about Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13, which is... The, uh, the lesson in the Bible that talks about uh, faith, hope, and charity, charity, and the greatest of these is charity, i.e. love. Uh, so it also talks about um, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. face. And so if everybody, in fact, does have a mask on and is not telling the truth or not seeing the truth, that was another reason for the masks. Another aspect of mm -hmm. it. I want, I want to back up one second uh, to talk a little bit about you were at the arena uh, in Washington, uh, as you said, in the mid-60s. How did you get, let's get up to that point from when you actually first started in the theater, when you knew you wanted to be an actress? Did you... Uh, I was about that big. <laughs> really, did you I was know, an itty-bitty. Really, you really knew for, for... Where did you grow up? I grew up in um, Boston. My father was a surgeon and my mother had been a nurse. So the, everything was medical in my family. Nobody had really been in the theater except da Dad had been at the University Players, uh, which was a summer stock group in Cape Cod in the late right. 20s. And um, at the time in that university playing group was Hen Henry Fonda, Margaret Sullivan, Jimmy Stewart, Nina it was, Foch, it was quite a group. Joshua Logan. And I think Dad made the right decision in opting for medicine. <laughs> <laughs> he was in fast company. Yes. Well, now tell but, me, so did you... In high school, did, were you in, in plays in high school? And then, yes. And I was in every school play I could possibly get into. I was in community theater. I went to summer stock several seasons as a teenager, as an apprentice. And uh, it was pretty clear that that was the direction I wanted to go. However, my dad really believed strongly, and my mother as well, that an education was very important and that um, certainly uh, college in particular would only reinforce any work that I might do in the theater by broadening the world to me. And that made a lot of sense to me. Um, and I wanted an ace in the hole in case I didn't succeed as an actress. And I loved math, so I was a math where, major. Were you really? <laughs> where did you go to college? Well, I went to Sarah Lawrence College yes. for two years. And then I went to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland for a year. And then that was it for my college because the theater was uh, such a magnet for me. I could not you stay have, away. I, I did a year of graduate work at the University of Edinburgh. Did Scott. you? I did. Oh, my. Uh, Maybe we were there at the same time. No, I'm afraid I think I was ahead of you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but well, no, when were you there? 1959, 60? Yes, I was ahead of you because uh -huh. I was there uh -huh. in the early 50s. But t how did you happen to get to the University of Edinburgh? Well, my heritage is Irish on my dad's side. I wanted to go to the University of Dublin to Trinity. And, um, and um, I, I, I sent away for an application and they responded in Gaelic. <laughs> and I wrote back, I don't speak or read Gaelic, would you please send me one in English? And they sent me back a letter in Gaelic. 
Or what, so so it, I knew fairly that strong, <laughs> fairly strong hand. That was the Irish national yes. movement of the time. So I said, "Oh my gosh, where else can I go where they speak English?" Because I didn't really want to contend with the language and math at yes. the same time. So I went to uh, Edinburgh. And Edinburgh had a very strong math uh, program. Very as, strong. As I recall. Very strong math program. And uh, so. well, now then after you. What happened between the time when you did finish that year at Edinburgh and got to uh, the arena stage? Were, were you acting in, in summer stock, or which was, I guess, still going strong at that point, or was it? Well, you're right. I did do a, a summer at the, the, new, Lo the new Loeb Theater in, in, Cambridge, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yes. Um, Faye Dunaway and I were in a fledgling company, and we, uh, we, we did a summer there, and then I... Um, I came t to New York pretty quickly. Uh, I was a ski bum for several months, deciding what to do with my life. And I came to New York pretty quickly and w got work for um, an agent, a theatrical agent, as a girl Friday. And um, he didn't help me. <laughs> but I did a lot of uh, workshop productions yes. and off, off Broadway. And then I got a standby for Sandy Dennis in A Thousand Clowns. Oh, really? Yeah. So I was able to work with Jason Robards, because Sandy was out a couple of times. Right. And then Dane Clark, who took over. And that was the beginning. And then I decided that I wanted to go out of town, which was a big move in those days. Absolutely. Because most actors waited for the big break in, in New, New York, York City. Absolutely. But I knew somewhere that what I wanted to do with my life was really dedicated to the theater, ideally a life like Catherine Cornell had had, where she would do a show in New York and then take it on All, uh, the on road tour, for yes. a year. But by the time I grew up to that, that theater was gone. It, yes. It really didn't Actually, exist. Actually, we were speaking before we started uh, about Julie Harris. She's one of the few people left who really I think tours. she is the only yes, one who, who still tours. Who, and who's able to draw the audience in whatever she does in it, because they know her. Yes. But uh, it's, it's disappeared. But what has taken its place uh, in, in a very different form is the regional theater, which now, of mm -hmm. course, is now actresses and actors go to the regional theater hoping to get their start there. But when you did it, it was really sort of jumping off the end of the world. Exactly. In a way. <laughs> and, Leaving uh, New York was just that. Oh, you're not going to be an actress anymore? I said, right. no. But I wanted to do the classics. And I had been studying St. Joan, Shaw's Joan, for since I was about 14 years old. And I was um, at the Charles Playhouse in Boston um, for a season. And um, I was told about a production of St. Joan at Arena Stage, so I raced down and I auditioned for it, and I got the part. Oh, terrific. Who, who directed that production? Ed Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes quite incestuous. But, in fact, <laughs> it was a, sort of a good kickoff to our long relationship because he really did think that I was a very fine actress at that time, and the love relationship you, came quite a bit later. later. But, but so you, you got to play a variety of parts then at the arena, mm -hmm. and you were with some very good actors. Uh, mm. And because uh, I worked a season actually with Ned Beatty, I directed a season at the Barter Theater in Virginia, and, and Ned was my main my of chief course. actor yes, at that point. Yes, I remember him talking about yes. the Barter. Yes, and uh, so but there were some really, as you mentioned, some really marvelous actors, Bob Prosky, and yes. some terrific people at that. And now this is the route that most. I mean, I presume if a young actress asked you how to get started and how to get experience, I presume you would advise them to try to get into a regional theater company. Absolutely, if they could. Yes. Uh, of course, a lot of them don't have companies anymore year-round, like we, we had 40 they, weeks of guaranteed employment. Now some they of, job in a lot of people they do. from New York. I guess there are not that many. I mean, I think the Guthrie, perhaps, and a, a few now still have mm -hmm. a company, but probably a lot don't, which is too bad, again, from the same standpoint of getting a variety of, of, of roles to play and different experience, which you had that chance to do. That's right. And also we had, I think it was one or maybe, one season of real repertory where we did three plays and kept rotating them. That so, was so, so exciting. One night you would be one thing and the next night in an entirely That's different right. role. And that, that is a rare and a very challenging, but... And the it, best way to do it, theater, yeah, I mean. It really but it, 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 it's too costly. Yes. Nowadays. Because you have to be able to change the sets every yeah. night and all of it. It takes much more in the way of resources, really, to do that. Yeah. You mentioned playing strong women, and you have played on television a lot of important American women, ranging <laughs> from Eleanor Roosevelt to, to Lam Calamity Jane to Georgia O'Keeffe. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that 
playing those women and, and also at the same time about the medium of television vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the stage and theater? Well, um, television came to me, fortunately. Um, after we did The Great White Hope, as you've mentioned, and then uh, James Earl and I did the movie of The Great White right. Hope, and we both got Academy Award nominations, and then that, that opened up a whole world to me of film and television. And um, I was very fortunate that the late David Suskind, at that time in the early 70s, had this idea in his head to do a mini-series about the Roosevelts. And ABC said, well, it sort of sounds interesting, but they kept postponing it. But meanwhile, he wanted me as his Eleanor. And he had FDR Jr., who has also since passed away, and Joe Lash, who wrote the definitive biography, Eleanor and Franklin, uh, approve me to play Eleanor Roosevelt. And um, so I was very fortunate in having about a year and a half to do oh, research. To immerse yourself in the character. It was the luckiest thing because nowadays, you know, I was just talking to Roma Downey who did um, Jackie uh, Kennedy, Onassis, and she, uh, she had two weeks. <laughs> I mm. mean, that's sinful. Yes, it really is. So she's a very fine actress and she did a fine job, but for her it was very anxiety-ridden. Yes. I felt very, very fortunate to do that. And the series, in fact, the public loved it and it was... Um, uh, very important. Then, because m my my family heritage on my father's side is Irish that emigrated to uh, covered wagon to South Dakota and then Nebraska, I've always been interested in the American West and I'm a bit of a buff on it. And I wanted to do a Western heroine. And I couldn't, I read all the pioneer diaries and everything, but I kept coming back to Calamity. <laughs> I kept coming back to her because she was such an oddball. And somehow, her, all the things she did were so many of the things that the men had done at the time. Right. And she was a drunk, yes, and she was all of this, but she had a great heart. So I presented this as a project to CBS, and they said, yes, let's do that. Then, and sometime in the 70s, because I'm a bit of a feminist, to say the least, um, <laughs> I, I was very smitten with the great Georgia O'Keeffe because she, she seemed to represent to so many women everything that one could be. She seemed to have it all and be a strong mythic figure as well. And I sat on her doorstep and finally got to spend an afternoon with oh, her. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yes. Well, that must have been uh, quite and, an experience for you, did Oh, it? it was wonderful. It really was wonderful. And I wasn't wrong in my feelings about her. You know, she was well, that's, everything that's, that that's, I thought. That's wonderful because so often you build it up in your mind, and the person, even though it's a, a rare experience, they're not quite. You know, they they disappoint you in some way. She didn't disappoint at all, but she was far more girlish really? than I had ever imagined. <laughs> she laughed all the time, giggled, in fact. That's interesting. At ninety, because you say you do think of her as that, as you mentioned, mythic figure. I mean, she's yes. an icon, almost, yes. really. And, uh, but that was a great advantage for you to... Uh... I didn't have a film in mind at all at that time. Oh, it really? wasn't in my mind at all. And then when she died, um, people started to approach me about doing a film about her. And I was thinking, oh no, this isn't... I don't, she was such a private person, it wouldn't work. Well, finally, everybody was jumping in, so I said, I might as well jump into the waters. And I persevered, and then we did the PBS film. Right. Tell, let's speak just briefly about, because you mentioned that you are a strong feminist. Uh, talk, just a, no, talk a little bit about your feelings about the artist and social issues and politics. I mean, should they, how much do you think they should be, uh, a person should be involved? Are there any limits to it or what? And how do you feel about it? Well, art is politics. Yes. <laughs> Art is politics. I'm not talking about slogans or uh, necessarily uh, banners or anything like that. I'm just talking about... If or it, didactic if, material no. that you... Yeah. But an artist has something to say. If they don't have so something to say, then what is art? I mean, why, why do it? Well, let's just go out and look at the moon. Right. So um, I, 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 I've never separated who I am from what I do in my work. But you have been, you, but you are involved in a lot of, I mean, outside 
the profession, you do get involved, don't you, in organizations? Well, I do, but I, I, I want to caution that I don't think that it's necessarily something that everybody should do. I do it because I need to do it. Right. I need it's to... very individual, but you feel, but for you, it's very important. It's very important. I, I was extremely distressed all through the 70s. Well, I had been in the early 60s about nuclear weapons and particularly about radioactivity and um, the poison that that was and will remain for quite some time, as we know. Um, so I had to get involved in that movement. I had to. I had to, to quell my own fears, if only to educate myself, educate other people. Um, Where are the gaps now? In, let's talk about in the arts, not in society, in terms mm -hmm. of women with opportunities. You hear it said, for example, that they're women have not had the opportunities they should have to be directors, in film particularly perhaps, but in other, is that one of the gaps, do you think? Where are the gaps as far as where women you feel do, have not had the opportunities they should have had in terms of work in the arts? Ed, I think the gaps will remain as long as women don't have economic power. Do you mean in the... In I'm talking about owning corporations and running corporations, owning banks, owning. and being the CEO of the bank as well. In other, words, in, in other words, positions of power and in the networks, the film companies. Exactly. Being, Journalism, everything. Being right from now, we do have people in the theater. We do, we do have people who've yes, begun to emerge in the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, the producers of The Secret Garden on Broadway That's or the right. musical, uh, most of the people who created it, but most of the people who produced it uh, were women. So That's now that right. hasn't really happened much, has it, in film? And, and Not yet, but it will, slowly. I mean, I truly believe that it has to. Um, and it, it'll start to happen more and more as women like Penny Marshall and Barbara Streisand make huge box office hits. Right. Which they've been doing. Sure. And it, so you think the answer will really come that way rather than some sort of theoretical or kind of hypothetical or... Sort oh, absolutely. It, it no, you can talk way. till you're blue in the face and things aren't going to change. But when it translates to money, I mean, it, it, it's John Singleton, who is a, a supremely gifted young 24-year-old black man and who got an Academy Award nomination, also was rewarded not because of the message of his film, but because it was a big box office big hit. Big box office success. You know? On this note of talking till we're blue in our faces, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to stop. Jane, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Ed. Uh, this has been Spotlight, and my guest has been Jane Alexander. Thank you. The preceding program was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Educational Foundation of America.